Hi, this is another update on my bare metal C64 emulator project for the Raspberry Pi. I released version 3.5 a few weeks ago, so I thought I would describe some of the new features that are available. Uh, so a while ago, a Lemon64 forum user noticed that while he was using his key raw with BMC64, a strange thing was happening. Some combinations of directions held on one joystick would prevent some buttons or directions from being pressed on the other. And at first I thought this was a bug in BMC64, so I went on to investigate, but it turned out that it was due to a limitation of the key raw itself. Um, here's an example of a combination that won't work. On joystick 2, if you hold down and then left, and then try to press fire on joystick 1, joystick 1 will not be able to fire, and this is only a problem for two-player games, but still it would be annoying if your opponent could prevent your player from moving or firing. Um, there are also other combinations that won't work. Um, so why does this happen? The Kira uses a USB controller, which is essentially um, something that turns a, a matrix into USB events for the host. Um, part of that matrix are the joystick connections. So really your joystick ends up acting like key presses and releases as though you're pressing and releasing keys on the keyboard. Um, but there's an issue that USB controllers have to deal with and that's called uh, ghosting. Uh, ghosting happens when three or more keys are pressed on the matrix, making it look to the scan that a fourth is pressed even though it's not. So in this example, even though switch S is open, uh, the scan for column B will see a high signal since W, E, and D will cause current to flow across row 2. Uh, one strategy USB controllers use to deal with this is that they simply block or ignore the signal if it looks like it will cause ghosting. Um, other controllers support what's called N rollover which either increases the number of simultaneous keys that can be detected or um, may not have any limit at all. So I contacted uh, individual computers and opened a ticket and they pretty much said it's a limitation of the controller. So if you do run into this issue, um, it's not a BMC64 issue. It will happen on Linux or any other operating system since it's essentially a hardware limitation. Um, it's a bit disappointing since it makes uh, two player, simultaneous two-player games kind of useless. Um, I mentioned in earlier videos that BMC64 supports GPIO scanning uh, of a real 60, C64 keyboard and I finally got around to putting together some of the boards I designed. <clears throat> um, this design is up, available on Upverter. Um, these boards won't have the problem I just described. Using GPIO, just like the real C64, all 10 signals, up, down, left, right, times 2, can be read independently since they all have dedicated input lines. Um, I sent out a few of these to some Lemon64 forum members and it worked out well for them. Now, uh, these only work with BMC64, although it's possible someone could write a driver for, um, for Linux. Um, I don't sell these, but you can make them yourself from the design available on Upverter with just a little bit of soldering skills and patience. And all the parts can be ordered from DigiKey. So for the Pi 3, I enabled interpolation and fast resampling audio sampling methods. Um, these were disabled initially because they caused way too much CPU on the Pi 2 and Pi 0. And one of my goals is to make sure that performance is acceptable on all the models. So sometimes I disable certain features in Vice that I know will cause the emulator to fall over. However, a uh, user on Lemon64 forum mentioned that a game called Mr. Angry wasn't making the door opening sounds properly, so I enabled this on the Pi 3, and performance was still good, so I brought it into that build. Um, interpolation is slightly better quality than fast sampling, and fast resampling is better than interpolation. And so to give you an idea of how this uh, improves uh, quality, here's the game Mr. Angry, and this is what it sounds like when you open a door with uh, fast sampling, which was the default before. Um, so you can hear it sounds kind of tinny and screechy. And I'll just reset and change the sampling, <clears throat> resampling method to fast resampling. And so you can hear that the door sounds more squeaky and that's what it should sound like or at least that's closer to what a real 64 would sound like so if you have a pi 3 uh, try that out and uh, you know if some games don't sound right that's probably why
So another feature I enabled uh, in this last release was dual SID support. Um, now, if you're familiar with Vice, you might be thinking that this is just part of Vice and I didn't really have to do any, any work to get it going. Well, I tried enabling dual SID before and uh, it completely fell over on the lower powered Pi 2 and even in some cases on the Pi 3. And uh, by fell over, I mean it ended up making emulation unusable because it couldn't make the vertical sync deadline to keep uh, 50 or 60 frames per second consistently. So I tried, um, or I decided to try something different. Um, so when you configure Vice to produce mono sound, as was the case in BMC64, the sound generation code produces samples into a, buff a buffer, something like this. And uh, so once the buffer is full, your driver delivers that to your hardware, say a few thousand samples at a time. Now for stereo sound, you don't have two buffers. The buffer you need to deliver typically needs to be left and right interleaved samples, so something like this. So when you turn dual SID on for stereo sound, um, that generation code runs twice, once for each SID chip. So first it will fill in all the left channel samples, and then once that's completely done, it will start to fill in all the right channel samples. Um, of course, this takes twice as long, um, and that was enough to make emulation unusable on the Pi 2. But this situation was perfect candidate for parallelization um, since those two operations were 100% independent of one, on one another and that, that is that the left channel doesn't really need to know anything about what the right channel is doing and vice versa so the two SID chips are independent of each other. Uh, so instead of doing things sequentially, I made a modification to my fork of Vice to do them in parallel. And um, when it comes time to generate two-channel audio, I first signal to another core to start filling in the right channel and simultaneously let the emulation core fill in um, the left channel. So uh, this worked out pretty well. Um, there's little to no penalty for adding uh, the SID chip, another SID chip this way. So even on the Pi 2, you can enable dual SID which I think might be a first. Um, I actually couldn't find any dual SID options on RetroPie or Combian to compare this, so this might be the first time it was done this way uh, on the Pi. Um, here's another audio related change I made. Uh, normally, Vice doesn't allow two SIDs to use the same base address or um, let them be configured differently. They have to be the same model. Um, but at the suggestion of a BMC64 user who heard I was working on the dual SID feature, uh, I modified Vice to allow this. And what this does is it simulates a real Commodore 64 mod you can do uh, where one SID is a 6581 and the other uh, is an 8580. And due to the slightly different characteristics in how those SID chips sound, you end up getting this stereo effect or a pseudo stereo effect on just about any game or piece of music. Uh, so I ended up making this modification in my fork of Vice and uh, was pretty happy with the results. If you listen to something like uh, Edge of Disgrace, which is a, um, a neat uh, demo with headphones uh, with dual SID enabled and you put 8580 on one side and 6581 on the other, you'll hear a nice uh, studio stereo effect. And it's just something neat you can do um, and it works just about on any game or um, music. On uh, previous releases, it was quite difficult to get integer scaling. Um, if you didn't like the default scaling interpolation that made the display look soft, you might have tried turning it off in the config, but then um, ran into this problem. The dimensions of the emulated, emulated display are quite small. It's something like 384 by 288. And this must be scaled up to a larger resolution to fill your screen. But if you scale up to say 720p, you end up getting some pixels fatter than others in both horizontal and vertical resolutions because the displayed dimensions don't get evenly divided by those frame buffer dimensions. And those variations would make the emulator look kind of ugly. So to solve this, um, I added some tools to let you crop or pad the frame buffer dimensions and then find even multiples that will fit inside your chosen display resolution. So here's an example. Let's say I'm using a 720p display. Um, I can bring up the menu and I would say turn off um, scaling interpolation um, but now you'll see that the um, but you'll see that the pixels look uneven um, you'll see something like this where the O doesn't look quite right 
and the M's are not, um, or sorry, the other O's and D's are not looking quite right. And those are scaling artifacts um, due to the fact that you don't have an integer scale at the moment. Um, but I can use the uh, new menu options under video. Um, I have these next H integer scale, so I can start cycling through uh, different integer scales and then do the same thing for the vertical. And then once you have integer scale on both horizontal and vertical, then everything kind of looks uh, pixel perfect. And um, once you get something that works well for that resolution and that machine, um, you can put, this, put those uh, parameters in the machines.txt file um, as scaling params. And uh, there's another menu option which lets you uh, set those integer scaling um, values uh, when, you, when you boot that machine. Um, and you can always trim the frame buffer a bit to uh, try and make things fit. Sometimes you might just be a little bit too large um, to get that next integer multiple uh, on that dimension. So um, you can use the, uh, the trim options on the border. So you kind of sacrifice a little bit of border in order to get um, more uh, dis of your display filled up. And uh, the integer scaling tools I mentioned before actually came from a discussion I had with a user who contacted, contacted me by email. He was trying to get um, a 15 kilohertz 240p mode working with BMC64. Um, and the advantage of using a mode like that is you get um, 288 or, or thereabouts real scan lines on a CRT display. So it's more like what the real machine would have produced. Uh, so just to be clear, this is not a simulation of a CRT, but actually using a real CRT uh, by using a DPI to SCART adapter. Um, now, not many monitors or TVs um, accept a 15 kilohertz mode. Um, so this may not work on all TVs, um, but this was tested on a Sony Trinitron TV and it ended up working pretty well. Uh, the configuration to get this working is available in the readme on the GitHub site. And finally, there was a Reddit post uh, a while ago uh, and YouTube video uh, posted um, by a user named Odie or Odie81. And he showed how to mod the C64 Maxi machine uh, to house uh, a Raspberry Pi and use BMC64 instead. So I made some modifications to BMC64 to properly allow an arbitrary Commodore and control key definition. So it wasn't quite working the way it should have been. You couldn't uh, actually change the Commodore key um, or control key. So I included that mapping uh, with BMC64. So if you're interested in performing that mod, you can select the mapping uh, in the menu. Okay, that's it for now. The next video, I'll get into um, a CRT shader work I've been doing um, to bring the same CRT emulation shader from RetroPie into BMC64. Thanks for watching.